Oh, yes. This is Goldar, and you're listening to Toku Secrets Podcast. Don't tune us out. Tune us in. <laughs> Avatar? Yeah. Street Fighter 6? Anybody play Street Fighter 6? Yeah. Oh, yes. We love these guys. Okay, good. Yeah. We know it's dressing, but you might need to change dressing. My name is Alan Z. I will be your host and moderator today. And here we have the legendary Dante Bosco. Make some noise for Dante. Yeah. Hello, Zuko. So legendary is going to go on. Make some noise for Jimmy. Thank you. So I, I think Dante kind of set it off already with a little character warm up, but um, I think the fans kind of want to see you guys do maybe some favorite quotes from different shows you've done, if that's cool with you guys. Yeah, I mean, favorite, anybody have a favorite line? Favorite Zuko line, anybody? What's yours? Oh yeah, watch it, Skinny. That's why I never signed. That's pretty yeah. good. <laughs> That's my favorite line. Why am I so bad at being good? So who in the back? What was your favorite line? Who was that? AJ? AJ? What was your favorite line, AJ? I love the little peasant. Oh, you little peasant. The Fire Nation Royal family got a problem with peasants, man. I don't know between me and my sister. I see. Yeah, no, very classist. Do you have favorite, favorite lines, Jenny? Do I have some favorite lines? It might not be the ones that you typically may know Suki may say, but my very naughty lines that I like are, you never told me you made out with a moon spirit. <laughs> and the other one is, someone reminded me of it today. Oops, wrong tent. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, of course, I mean, for, for, you know, the Jake Long fans, you gotta remember. It's the J to the A to the K to the E. Yeah. I'm the Mac Daddy Dragon of the NYC. Yeah. You So, yeah, what's yeah. going on? Alan, what's going on? What are we, what are so, we, yeah. Let's dive into some, um, I guess, questions about, like, your voice acting career. Sure. So, did you guys expect Avatar to be as big as uh, it is now when you guys were started doing it? No idea. No. <laughs> no. 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 I mean, when we first started Avatar, uh, yeah, no idea. You know, it's, it was a really a weird thing when I was first auditioned for Avatar because I was doing uh, Jake One the American Dragon. Both actually, me and May Whitman were both doing that show, and then we got this new show, which was, you know, for Nickelodeon for it, especially in those days. It's, obviously known for Spongebob Squarepants and like Cat Dog and these things. Shout out to the classic Nickelodeon stuff. And then they gave me a script that was this kind of epic adventure, Asian anime inspired characters and, uh, you know, four elements. And I was like, this isn't Nickelodeon at all. <laughs> like, what is this? And so I, part of me was like, this is never going to make it on the air. Let alone, you know, become this this kind of phenomenal hit and it was dealing with all these wild uh, and heavy topics in, in this really way like from like the first episode second episode talking about the genocide of one of the groups to obviously with light stuff light stuff yeah. abuse parental abuse of, of Zuko and, and all this kind of things and I was like how is this gonna air on Nickelodeon but it really uh, really surprised me yeah. I mean, I, I, we, this is jumping around, but it's funny because I know Dante, you and, you know, Olivia, they were doing cons pre-internet sensation, right. right? And so then here comes COVID, right? And all of a sudden, all my friends started texting me and they're like, Jenny, Jenny, um, um, uh, Avatar is on Netflix. I'm like, amazing, awesome. And so they're like, have you seen it? I'm like, no. So then I go in and I'm doing this job, I don't even remember what it's for, and the director used to work at Nickelodeon, and he was like, so, Jenny, how does it feel to be on the number one show on Netflix? I'm like, what are you talking about? He was like, Avatar, I'm like, oh, and, he's, and I said, maybe I should post about it. He's like, 
I don't think they need any help. And I was like, okay, whoops. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know, but like that's how I really started to see we got very lucky that it had this resurgence. And I mean, here we are today. So, um, oh, yeah, make some noise. that you guys have, you know, done the con scene for a while, have you had any, like, memorable fan interactions that you want to share with the crowd? I've had all kinds of crazy. No, I've been doing cons for a while. Like, like Jenny said, I started before, I don't know, I kind of got, actually, Azula, Grey Delisle, is the one who started me doing cons a bunch of years ago, and she was like, you gotta go to these cons, and at that point, Comic-Con had not really become what it's become, which is, I was just out there, but... As I've been around the scene, like the last, better part of the last probably 15 years, I really got to see the con scene grow and, and been a part of the community, the worldwide community over the last 15 years. And it really, it really is a community of, uh, of different community. You know, it's a community of different fandoms and communities that all kind of intersect throughout the world. Uh, as far as memorable experiences, there's been so many from obviously from emotional stories, how, how certain things that I, I've been have, have had good fortune to be a part of, uh, how they've touched people's lives. But I, you know, I was there during, you know, proposals, you know, as a fire alert overlooking couples, that was very cool. I remember- It happened last week in Rhode Island. Did it? I, you were down a few, and we were like, Ugh. And she's like, do you know I'm 15? She's like, it's a promise ring, it's a promise ring. And all of us were like, oh, oh, wow. it's a promise ring, it's a promise ring, okay. <laughs> I had some crazy ones. I mean, like, I remember that, and then I remember that I saw him at the bar later on about a round of drinks for the whole, everybody, and we kind of got turned up a little bit. That was pretty fun. I remember, uh, there's many times I've signed body parts and uh, tattoos happening on the body, which is crazy. One of my one of my favorite times at this crazy convention that's like a I forget the name of it but it was like uh, in a resort where it was like a kind of like a water park and stuff like that. Anyhow, was it Colossal? Colossal Con. One of the Colossals. So I was doing Colossal Con and I roll up into my panel and there's like a big panel room and it's packed and they're like and your panel's two hours. I said what? They said your panel's two hours. I'm like who, with who? They're like, just you. And I'm like, what? And so the panel's two hours. So I'm tripping. Not tripping, I'm just like, this is gonna be not great for me. But uh, no, it's cool. What happened was Colossal, if you have been Colossal, it's kind of like you're in this resort and it's kind of like you're on a cruise, but you're not, you know, you're just in the forest somewhere. And, there, and so fans start buying me drinks because it's also like a bar there. And so they're sending me up drinks. So I'll start getting a little loose, and then I got hungry, like the first half hour, and then I was like, uh, who's hungry? And then people raised their hands, and then I, I'm over there for two hours, right? So then I ordered uh, Domino's, delivers in 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, we ordered, I ordered like a bunch of pizzas, I ordered like 10 or 15 pizzas, and then we had uh, a pizza party. Like I brought the food and they brought the drinks and then we like got we got loose one time for a two hour hangout. That's great. It's the, it's the best. That's one of the best stories. About you, any, any great stories? I don't have any great stories, but um, I don't see this person here. But literally, uh, that's really fun. Okay. Okay. But but uh, I always say I I always oftentimes get very emotional at these things, right? So. I'll try not to get emotional now, but this morning I saw someone in the coffee shop and they just looked like they probably just needed a little hand, right? But I was like, oh, I, I want to like buy her breakfast, but I don't want to offend her. So I was like, Ugh, I don't know if I should do that or not, you know, but then I was like too shy. Like I, I'm kind of a shy person by nature unless I get to know someone. But so if I see this person in the con, I'm gonna buy them something because they just look like they needed something this okay. morning. But I was too shy. See, so don't hold back. That's my lesson. All right. Because now I'm like thinking about that. Yeah. yeah. That just happened this morning. Was it me? No. What I, was it me? I will buy you <laughs> ten pizzas, Dante. I don't, okay. I'm not shy about that. 
So um, I know you guys know them for like a lot of uh, voice acting work, but do you guys know that they're on-screen actors as well? Like anybody know? Yeah. Rufio! Rufio! Yeah. 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 Have you guys watched Take the Lead when it's Take the Lead? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm a cheerleader. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, California Dream. You know it. Hello. So I want I want to transition into into that work for you guys. Like, yeah. In terms of like uh, experiences and also differences, like what would you say is like pros and cons, or just pros if you don't want to share the cons of like Hollywood on-screen acting versus like voice acting? Um, I'm not a great memorizer, and which is, I can do it, but man, like as I grow older, I'm like, oh gosh, I love voice acting for not having to memorize and everything could be on the spot, but, but, um, on camera acting is a love of mine also and I love stage and I mean I've done different genres in the business but yeah I, I would say that the most part but I think all of it is amazing for its own you know reasons so yeah no they're all great and it's just different mediums right. um, I love it all I mean I love it all but also whatever it's like it's been a long career and there's certain times you're like it's great to go travel and like shoot things in real life, and, and that's amazing. But also sometimes I was somewhere and I was like, "Wow, this is a lot. I'm exhausted." <laughs> but and then it's so you know, it's what it really comes down to for me, and I think for most of us is like a great story. If you could be a part of a great story, and it doesn't matter if it's on stage, on film, television, or a, or VO, it's like those are the the stories what transcends and the stories what hits us heavy, hits the audience heavy. And we just hope, all of us, all of the Comic Cons around the world, we go to these Comic Cons because, you know, all these actors or filmmakers are part of great stories. And so that's really what I think draws us to kind of keep acting and being a part of it all. I think like storytelling is kind of like the core principle behind all the arts. 100%. If you guys don't know, these guys are multi hyping it's, it's not just acting. Like we spoke in earlier, these guys are also artists. Poets, yeah. you Poets. know, dancers. dancers. You guys know that, right? Like, we did a project together. Me and Alan did a project together. I actually guessed it on an album that he did with uh, Jason Chu, a buddy, um, a few years back. So it's an honor. First time seeing you in person. Yeah. Yeah. You can check it out on Spotify. You can download it on Spotify. I didn't want to bring it up, so thank you for. No, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing project, and it's called Face Value. The, pro, the, the track that we were on together is called uh, Model Minority, and you can download it on Spotify. It's actually really, really phenomenal. It's a great piece. I, I was not going to segue with that, but thank you. <laughs> but what I was going to say was, um, as far as like your journeys, especially like you know, like um, being Asian American, um, all three of us, you know, like have encountered a lot of struggles and a lot of just microaggressions. So. Not to get too deep or heavy, but like, or, or we can if you guys are okay with or... it. I wanted to, to, you know, give you guys an opportunity to talk about like what you know, what you see headed towards in terms of progression, in terms of the industry, and also of what you face and how you've seen it progress, like in terms of like uh, your careers. Yeah, I mean, me and Jenny, we've been around for a while. <laughs> and that's an understatement. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. So it's great to see it grow. The reality is, like Asians in in Hollywood are at the highest profile they've been in Hollywood in the history of Hollywood, right? Which is amazing. And uh, and our careers are just little 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 steps in the ladder that kind of help that along. And it's great to be a part of that because we've all risen together over the last uh, bunch of years. So there's more work to be done. There's more stories to be told, of course. But uh, yeah, it's very, I mean, we're both Filipino. So it's fascinating coming to Hollywood around the same time in the 80s and coming to town where no one even knew what a Filipino was. That's why I had to change my name, right? Right. Yeah, yeah sure, she's Filipino. Quan is not a Filipino name. Dante always represents for me and I appreciate that because literally when I was 11, when I started, so my maiden name was Fernando. And in the 80s, this didn't equate to a Fernando, so the agent literally went through a book and was like, ah, too many, blah, blah, blah. there you go, Juan. So it's been my business name since I was a kid. And these days, it was funny, I, I went to my relative's house last night, but these days, 
um, my cousin's wife was like, that would never fly today. And I said, yeah, it probably wouldn't, you know? But that's okay, you know, yeah. because I, I, you, I started at such a young age in a time when maybe you didn't see a lot of people like myself, you know? So my family was super supportive, and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate for that. Yeah. yeah. It's bad. It must be fascinating. Yeah. I had a lot of shit. It must be fascinating, like, at 11. Like, what did you think? Like, it's weird to have, like, a, a stage name at 11. What were you going through your mind at that point? In my, in, in, in my mind, I was like, well, that's really weird. Like, what? And then, and I'll be quite honest, I think a lot of it is like, oh, I can't be that. And um, a lot of people ask me too, because um, when I got on California Dreams, <clears throat> I used to get fan mail, right? More fan mail in the actual mail where people would write and say, hey, you know, like I've never seen anybody like who looks like me on TV. It makes me emotional actually. And at the time, because here's the thing, I was on a show that basically was somewhat diverse, which I feel Definitely very diverse. lucky yeah, about yeah. that. But in actuality, I was like, oh my God, I don't, I hope that like, I keep this job and I don't want to be different. And I, because I was thinking from an actor point of view. And again, the, the society reflected that and I was so young that I would say thank you. But now these days over the years, I'm really able to understand what that really meant. And um, back then. And a couple of my friends, they would tell me, they're like, do you know that you were the first series regular Asian woman on a show? I was like, yeah. are you sure? I don't know if that's really true, but, One you know, of them. I mean, got it. Yeah. Yeah, close. I, uh, right I don't even know. You I mean, know, I but, just take it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it was Jerry Kwan, oh, yeah. you guys. Uh, you know, I mean, there have been a lot of Asian women who who are in movies, and but I don't know about series regular. I guess I'd have to research that. But I think over the years, reflecting back on that, I'm able to really see that now and really take it in all the way and, and really be present with that. Or in the 20s, again, it's just like, I'm, I'm an actor, I want, you know, not that I didn't appreciate it, but I just really can see what that really means right. now, if I'm being quite honest, yeah. And representation, you know, the words are the buzzword now, but yes. for a whole generation that grew up with some of this, the work I've done and we've right. been, I'll get stopped by a lot of people. Absolutely. Asian or not, they're like, you're the first Cool Asian I ever saw on film and television. Cool Asian. Like you're the right? first cool Asian. I'm like, wow, okay, um, that's dope. You know what I'm saying? Or like, uh, you know, like it'd be. And I wrote about the book a little too. It's like I think it's like an interracial couple will come to me, you know, and it'll be a guy or a girl, you know, a guy and it'd be like Asian dude with like a, a white girl from black or from Latin, something different. He's like, you know, I gotta tell you this, man. My wife. I had a big crush on you growing up, and I know for sure you're one of the reasons why she married me. <laughs> and I feel like, you're welcome. So, I mean, that too is just kind of... That's true representation. It's true representation. Yeah, that's where it matters, It's where it matters. Yeah. Sometimes it's just, it's just opening up the, uh, you know, the reality is, you know, as you grow up, you understand we're all, we're all everything. But for a generation, especially when they, you didn't know an Asian person and they didn't live next to you or whatever, and so when you see an Asian representation on screen, it may be one of maybe five characters you see in your whole life. And so like it or not, or you're going to judge a whole community based on one of these five characters that you see. And so being able to be one of those five characters and, that, and opening... Uh, the, the consciousness of what is possible for that community just a little wider was something I didn't set out to do, but it was something that I, as I look back and the reflection of the audience and what happened with my career, I'm very proud of that, you yeah? know? Well, there's something that um, Dante had said when we did a panel like three years ago that I wanted to uh, have him kind of elaborate on, and he mentioned something about like, for most of us growing up, like we watched cinema from the views of like a heteronormative white male lens, right? And so, like, we fall in love as a white man. We fall, we, we cry as a white man. We laugh as a white man. We get the girl as a white man. 
And so now with more diversity, I feel like I'm. If I'm I remember saying that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, what I say? What I say, Alan? I'm like, yeah. oh, I said that. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you kind of expand on that. No, you're right. I, I mean, we talked about discussions, and we talked about Hollywood and storytelling, and, and like I said, all these great comic cons about great storytelling, and people go, what is representation? And I go, you have to understand, like until now, the beginning of Hollywood, the last hundred years, 99% of all the stories written. We're told, you know, from the perspective, they're written by straight white men. And these are roles I've done, roles we've all done, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not saying that's even racist or bad. That's just saying one group has held the reins on, on the percep perception of what's going on. That's Hollywood as we know it. But now as we go into the future, what's happening now and forward is about other people and other groups really, their voice is counting. And it's about art to conversation, right? And so, of course, many minority groups uh, felt some type of way about being represented in those stories. But in the future, we're, it's us telling our stories because no one knows our stories like we know. And, and Like we, the movie you wrote. Yeah, like the movie I wrote, Fabulous yes. Filipino Brothers. Definitely. Yes. Thank you. Which, you know you made it when your movie is on the airplane. Yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> So the good thing is, in the future, it's like there's more voices being represented and the conversation of art going back and forth. So it's, yeah. that's really, I think, where we're heading, which is a more healthier place to be. And really also just the forward of Hollywood and things like Parasite winning the Oscars and everything everywhere all at once. And just having that conversation through art. And that's, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm happy where we're going. There's something that Jenny said I wanted to touch on, too, when you said that um, when you were younger, like you were a little afraid to kind of set boundaries for yourself as an actor because you just want a job. And I think as artists, we're just typically all people pleasers. We're just like, we like you. Like, so for you guys, like, what was kind of like the point where you're just like, I'm going to take back ownership of like myself, my identity, and not let people dictate what roles I should get and what roles don't suit me? You know, I think it, that's a process. And I think, again, as Dante was speaking about that, it's been interesting, you know, it, what I think is actually really beautiful is that the internet and things like streaming and um, as much as it might, you might think it's like too much, there has been more room, like we're saying, for people to create content. There is more possibilities of that, right? And so as I've aged and really, you know, you think your career is going to go one way, but you never know how it's going to go. But I think just as I've grown older and really just seen what the potential is, it's given me more freedom to also do my own creating. It might not look like someone else's, but, you know, when you're young, and it, again, in my instance, I was just like thinking of it from the point of view as, I think, an actor who is a woman who is in a... It, it was just true, and like a male-based, like you're saying, like writing. I was just like, I just want to know where I fit in. And now it's like, well, listen, if I don't fit in here, I may as well just create it myself. Right. Because if I'm not going to do it, who else is? You know, like you have to be, you can get all the support that you want, which I always encourage, but I also think you have to also support yourself, you know, and that's that's part of our journey, right? Like. There's so many people who come up uh, and, you know, in different mediums, but the, there's so many artists and, you know, like, I just know, for example, on California Dreams, it was like there used to be so many people who would be, quote unquote, extras on the show, right? Well, some of them ended up being really famous or they, you know, you never know. Like, like there's so much possibility, right? So I think just over time, getting to know myself better and knowing... To me, like I really believe there's always a place at the table, and sometimes when people aren't really ex accepting of that, you just have to present what you're really good at and you know, create a seat for yourself, you know? And so that's something for me that I, I work on, you know what I mean? In whatever arena, because I think that's very possible, so. And again, being, you know, being who we are, Filipino, being Filipino is a very uh, ethnically ambiguous kind of Asian even. It's like we're like Asian, Latino, brown skin. Like we didn't, 
And Hollywood's all about putting you in categories. A box. Boxes. Especially so, back yeah. in the day. And even now, it's all about casting. Yeah. You know, and again, you can say it's racist or this stuff, but it's really casting. They're trying to figure out what it is and, and what you can deliver with. But when you talk about boundaries and what you can do, what you cannot do, uh, my whole career, you know, it's also people want to cast exactly right, but I'm like, we're trying to figure it out because I'm like, if I had to wait to play a Filipino role, I would have never had a career. Part of my career was always about, um, you know, trying to steal a role from a white kid or trying to steal a role from a black kid or trying to steal a role from a Latino kid. And the reality about Hollywood is whether you're black, white, Asian, Latino, male, female, gay, straight, trans, it's a hard business. Like it's Period. not really built yeah. to win. It, we're all fortunate to, to do any work. So to overcome that and to break through is, is a blessing. And, um, and what I found ultimately, one, you know, one director said, you know, they said to Dante, you know, you're gonna do some great things, especially for your community. I go, why? He goes, because, because we see you before we see like your ethnicity. I said, what? He goes, we see you, like we see Dante. And I was a young kid and it, and it reminded me, or he taught me a lesson. I try to talk to young actors and I go, look, you gotta get your skills up. You have to do your training. Um, you gotta get lucky, but the better you get, the luckier you get. But what you can't ever forget is, you know, you come to this town, there's gonna be people prettier than you, handsomer than you, more talented than you. Everything you think you are, there's someone better than that, than you in this town. But the only thing that you have that they don't have is you. And you cannot lose yourself. So if you can actually bring yourself, when this director told me, like, we see you. And I go, that's the thing, that's the courage to reveal yourself. If you have the courage to reveal yourself and you can play the character where you and the character intersect, that's the true place to play it. And whether you get the job or not, like that's that's what you're supposed to play. And then you start to see it. And then that, I think that's the thing to help transcend people. So uh, transcend stories. There's so much audience out there when we talk and they're like, oh, like they know, they talk to me like they know me. And I guess that you, you do kind of, you know what I'm saying? Because there's certain things and certain roles I've done where I'm there. Like I'm like Dante's in there. And so it's great to have these conversations and again to be part of these communities and talking. Um, so that's the boundary. It's like you're putting yourself, you and the characters, a little bit of you and the character, a little bit of the character in you. And then when it connects to the audience, like they're connecting to, to you. And you know, if I can interrupt there, I think that's so beautiful because the thing is, a lot of the times, right, we're human, it's like, oh, I don't want people to see that part of me or whatever, but what Dante's saying is he's just had the courage to show who he is, and that's why you guys all relate to, like, when you walk down the street with Dante, people are like, oh, Dante, blah, blah, like, it's unreal, right, because he's just being himself, right, and so... I remember that there's this quote that one of my acting teachers said, it's, artists reveal what others want to conceal. Ooh. Right? Ooh. And so I always, Ooh. I can't take credit for that. It's Carol Carol. It's Jenny, Jenny Kwan said that. No, 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 no. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I remember that all the time. But that's what it is. It's like, so when people say, you know, they have an essence, this is what, da this is Dante. What you, like, that's why people gravitate towards him because he is sharing who he is part of himself with everybody freely, right? With, to a certain degree, right? And so I think that's a thing for all of us is like, how do we share these gifts that we have, right? And be ourselves and not be afraid to just really, it sounds so cliche, but you know, be yourself. That's what it is. Because people want to gravitate towards these special things that we all have to offer, right? Because it, it is very unique to each person. So I think, you know, to just kind of reflect on this. And then again, what did you say? What did you say? You <laughs> say <it one> time. <laughs> reveal something. What's up? Artists reveal what others want to conceal. There you go. She just made that up, guys. I did it! I swear! It's all, like, it's all those actors in the movies that were like, oh my god, or when we cry in songs where it's just like, I'm gonna cry at that. There's something that that artist has just really just let down and really was present about that. So that's what we connect with. That's at least what I think we connect with.
So, like, to reiterate, like, um, would you say that, like, the X factor that people say that some stars have is really <coughs> just their ability to be vulnerable? I like, think so. Yeah. I mean, it, some people just have it. Right. You know what I mean? And I think, I think, <laughs> get out of here. I'm so serious. Think, um, the, the other thing is, like, it's like, the, again, with the fan base and, like, with the community of Comic Con, I've learned so much through the years because it's like, you know, there's some people like, I follow you, I follow you, and then you're like, and you're like, no, 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 I follow you. They're like, what? Like, no, we, it's a conversation, it's an engagement. And what you, what I realized and I've come to learn, and being a fan of myself, of so many other filmmakers and artists, is we're fans of, um, we're only fans of certain people and certain things because it's a reflection of ourselves. That's really beautiful. I mean, it's real. Like, you think it's something else, but you're only fans because it's a reflection of you. And so, you just made that up, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, again, like, don't forget you in the, in the, we can never forget ourselves in this, in this communication, in this engagement, in this, it's, it's, we're this relationship, really, you know? Um, so, tying it back to Avatar, you know, in terms of the con community, like, were you guys kind of surprised to see, like, something that was so Asian-inspired become this global thing. Like, because like, there's so many elements in that show where it's like, you, you would think it's set up to fail. It's just like, oh, this is like me how high long, but it's not because it's so deep and so many like, there's so, it's such a nuanced show. Like, did you guys feel like uh, kind of blown away by the fact that like something so rooted in Asian culture? I mean, it's, like, it's the anime gateway drug. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. It's the show that just launched, like just a whole generation. Um, it really, it really was crazy because it's, it's uh, even with Comic Con, you know, like if you say we're Asian or we're Asian American, and, and there's like a lot of girls who are like trying to fight who we are and where our voice is at, and I always try, even when I talk to Asian American clubs around and around the world from the country, I was always like, listen, even though we have work to do, you gotta see where we scale. They're like, what does that mean? I go, as Asians, like every cook, cooking show, there's an Asian winning every cooking show. I'm like, okay. I did, I did not win worst cooks, <laughs> yeah. by the way. I, I like, thought I was on the track. Sorry. I was like in the e-gaming world, Asians are like pro e-gamers, you know, like African Americans in the NBA. Like, really? Like, yeah, we, like, I've been to League of Legends championships where these kids are just superstars. And I said, in Comic Con, you go to San Diego Comic Con, right? And you're like, it's the biggest con in the world. It says the biggest convention for the modern arts. And when you go to the Comic Con world, it's the only world, the only kind of like world community where like everyone knows Asian stuff. Asian stuff is at the highest tier of all of the art here. It's the only kind of community where everyone is trying to be a little more Asian. Like in, in America, you either lean more like towards white culture, you lean a little more towards black culture, towards white music, towards black music. You come to Comic Con world, everyone knows what Kawhi is, everyone speaks a little Korean, everyone, you know, even trying to look a little more Asian, like, that, this is a weird pocket where being Asian is, we feel what it may feel to be, like, black in hip-hop, or to be, you know what I'm saying, like, it's what? I'm like, yeah, but you gotta see what it is and understand that in the modern arts, where we are here, people are dressing, looking very anime, and so, it's just kind of, it's not, nothing's better or worse, it's just understanding where the cultures are and where people are digging and vibing. So when Avatar hit, it was a, it was a kind of like a step into leaning into a culture and kind of seeing how that's influencing people and how people are feeling that. Like, we can go in between things and understand it, but that's a, a clue to what's, what's popping over here and for us all to, we can experience that in the same way. I think what he's trying to say is Avatar ended racism. Okay. <laughs> Avatar! It's just, you know, I'll tell you real talk. I was at um, New York Comic Con, right? And uh, COVID just opened up. It was so crazy. Everybody's there. It's the, what, the biggest show on Netflix at the time. And some guy, some kid, well, he was like 23, 24, and he's like bringing some stuff to sign. He's like, yo, we grew up with you. And, He's kind of giving me my flowers. I'm like, hey man, thanks man, I'm glad we're there. And he goes, no, no, you don't understand. And I go, I, I don't understand what? And then he like took a moment, he looked at me, and he said, uh, you know, he said, he said like, you, you programmed our generation. And I said, what? 
He goes, you guys, you guys programmed our generation. I said, what does that mean? He goes, you know, why do you think we're the generation that brought protests back? I said, what? He goes, Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the Me Too movement. I'm like, right. He goes, we're trying to get the world back in balance. Man, I'm so deep. I, don't, I have like. <laughs> so, like, when you do these cons, and you, like you said, like, it feels like a gateway to, to into like Asian culture. Like, do you feel like a. Like uh, Asian Americans just step more into the con scene to, to kind of like, um, like for example, if they're artists and they're actors, like do you feel like they should actually embrace it more? Because I know you mentioned like, when, and when it comes to scaling, like it's not that someone's better or worse, it's that you need to find where you can get your flowers. Like, would you guys say that like this con scene is something that Asian Americans should actually like step uh, into more? I don't know. I mean, I think you. I think ultimately it's all an organic thing and an authentic thing, and you kind of. You know, I didn't grow up in the con scene. Yeah. I grew up in the club scene, I grew up in the hip hop scene, I was a b-boy, so I, that's my whole experience, right? Mm -hmm. But then I was embraced by the con world and had a, been having a, a crazy event for the last decade and a half. And again, when I came to the con scene, um, I didn't pretend like I was of the con scene. I was just like, yo, like, uh, let me, I feel the love, let me, let me, let me, you know, let me give some love back. And I brought what I could bring to it. So I would throw parties. I threw like clubs. I would DJ. Um, I threw like the opening party for for San Diego Comic Con a few years. I threw club cosplay clubs in LA. I would go to my club friends in LA and I would say, "Can I get the club on a on an off night?" And they give me the club on a Wednesday, like the biggest club in town, like on Holly Boulevard or something. And I threw like a cosplay club, sold it out, and everyone's like, "What is this?" And so, you know, again, you can kind of get into the scene, but it's really, you got to stay authentic yeah. and keep it, uh, and keep, again, bring yourself to the scene. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, also, I know that you guys mentioned before, like, if you don't see a story uh, told, then tell it yourself. So I wanted to kind of uh, give you guys time to talk about, like, any projects you guys may have done, like, outside of the system, and something that you constructed. Uh, like, for example, like, five... Uh, Filipino brothers, they debut, and you know, like just things like that that you may want to tell the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, so yeah, so it's it's funny. I um, started a couple years back uh, for California Dreams. Like people constantly ask me about it um, at cons or not cons, and so one of my best friends and I from the show, we started producing concerts. And and here's the thing. For example, it's like. People ask me, why is the show not streaming? Why is this? Why aren't you guys doing this? Why? So one night, my girlfriend Kelly and I were at a concert of a very famous band that I will not mention the name. And so we were watching, and it was like, mm, it was okay. It was okay. Damn. Yeah, I, exactly. I will not mention who it is, but it was okay. And so she leans over to me, and she was like, how come we can't do this? And I said, well, we can but we have to do it ourselves, right? So it's that thing, it's like no one, you know, was like bringing us to cons, even though my friends wanted to do that. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll do it. So I'm on my third time producing a convention and, or like a, it's like a little mini California Dreams convention where we have events and the next one is coming up in July. It's my shameless club, but not really shameless, but because I've worked so hard, you know, to do that when, there it is, it's like a big backer is not backing us, it's like I'm the one who's doing it, I'm, I'm on my third one, and um, because people keep asking about it. The right? band plays and the band the plays? The band is playing. Come on. I do not like trash acts, thank you. And so finally we got invited to our first con as California Dreams, you know, and so that's going to be at the end of July, but um, so that's just basically me taking it into my own hands and and when people ask why are you doing it I really was thinking at the time so the show was kind of if you guys don't know kind of like I say by the bell but we had music and we had a record deal and um, I think at the time and I still do believe that we need this like there's so much stuff in the world that's like we don't really, it, it's just we don't we don't need to always be feeling those negative feelings but with something like this it's very nostalgic and 
makes you feel good and people seem to like the music, you know? So um, I think that's something that's still very worthwhile and actually needed. So, and it's fun. So we have fun doing it, except sometimes, you know, like it's behind the scenes. They're like my brothers and sisters and I'm like, Ugh! but it's fun <laughs> other than that, right? Um, yeah, so I'd say that. Yeah, and I feel you, it's like, we're creatives, just like everybody. Yeah. That's why I love coming to Comic Cons, because we're creatives, whether you're a cosplayer or a fan favorite writer, or writer in general, or you know, you, you do props or crafts, it just, the, the, the feeling to create and the feeling to tell our stories through music, film, it just continues. And if you have that feeling, no one should stop you. You should create it. If you have the idea to create something, you need to create it. And whether you're getting paid for it or not, and, you know, I've been in this career a long time and I get, you know, there's jobs that I get and you're working for other people and there's always something that I'm working on myself because I just... I don't know. People are like, Dante, you're so busy. You're always doing something. And, I, and, I, and it upsets me sometimes, too, because I'm like, why am I doing all these things? But, uh, yeah, it, and it goes from things like I, I wrote and directed my first film, The Fabulous Filipino Brothers. You can watch on Hulu right now. Thank you, my direct trailer debut. Also on the airplane, guys. If you're on the airplane. On the airplane. You made it. Uh, I mean, I wrote a book, Come from Rufio to Zuko, some memoirs. Yeah, thank you. We did that on Amazon. I'm actually uh, running a one-man show right now, based on stories from the book, so hopefully I'll be able to tour that soon. Um, but other things, you know, like, like I said, I'm DJing at Comic-Cons and stuff. It's like fun and interesting. Me and my wife, we just started a, a matcha company called Rufio Matcha. You can get, Have you guys tasted it? It's very high-end. If y'all like, if y'all know anything about matcha, ceremonial grade matcha. There's some at my table, but you can always go to rufiomatcha.com. Like again, it's new ways to tell stories through food, film. I mean, music. I did a music track with him. I'm always working on music and loving music. I write poetry, and it's just like I said. I see so many creative people in the room. That's why I come to cons because we're amongst our people. And but if you have that, that, that energy, that vibe to like create something, it's not wrong. You're right. It's in you. It's, it's hard in you. To be Make it. Yeah. Make it. Do it. It's, it needs to go somewhere. That's what we're supposed to be yeah. doing. So do it. I, I applaud other people and I try to keep that creative juice alive in myself. Absolutely. Um, speaking of you guys, I wanted to kind of give you guys time to ask these guys some questions. So, yes. would you guys mind uh, being a runner? And yeah, so you guys have questions for you guys, right? Yeah. All right, cool. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I got this one <laughs> mic and I'm going to hold this on. He's like, this is mine. You're creative, you're creative, you're creative. Hi. Hi. Hello. I have a question for Zuko. How long have you ever done like your voice impressions? Like how long have you been like keeping it up? I just, um, I, I'm fortunate as a voice actor to do like one voice. My <laughs> <laughs> voice. I'm a lucky son of a gun. You know, I tripped in the world of voice acting and uh, I just acted like there was a camera in the room, but there was only a microphone. And I just, I just kept going. So I, I, I'm lucky that I don't have to really kind of do a lot of voices, I just get to do my voice, and they, they will, if they like that voice, they hire me. And uh, I'm thankful, so I've been doing my voice my whole life. <laughs> well, like you're the coolest voice actor I've ever met. Thank you. Questions? Ooh, I've been reading the Question, how was it working with Robin Williams? And Robin Williams, rest in peace. He's one of the greatest ever do. Uh, he was phenomenal. He was everything, man. He was the genie from Aladdin. I tell you, he was magical, funny, witty. Um, just the life of the whole set and crew, you know? He kept the morale of the whole crew going for the whole year he shot. But at the, at the same token, on the flip side, I'd be able to hang out with him and have quiet conversations with him. And we talked a lot about poetry, because uh, I was a big fan of Dead Poet Society. And so we had epic conversations about his favorite poems and poets and mine. And he was very supportive of me being a poet. So I love that guy forever. Rest in peace, Robin Williams. <laughs> He's a guy. Look, you gotta understand, you guys. 
When I was 15, I did the movie Hook. I see Captain Hook in the back. Capitan Hook in the back. When you, you know, I worked with Steven Spielberg at the height of his powers, arguably the greatest actor, I mean, greatest director of his time, maybe, you know, top, top five of all time, right? And then you got Dustin Hoffman, who's one of the greatest character actors of all time. Uh, it's definitely Mount Rushmore of his time. I'm like Pacino, De Niro, De Hoffman, Nicholson. Like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and then you got Robin Williams, who's probably the, the, the most unique actor in, brought improv to films. Like, these are gods. Like, we're all creatives and we're, and we're artists, and whether you do music, film, whatever you're doing, when you look at these guys, I would show up on my days off to watch these guys work. Literally just sit, I'm not working, but I got a badge, I get on the set. And so I'm, you know, if you're within, the, you guys as creators, if you have the good fortune or wherewithal to, to be in the presence of greatness, show up. I would just show up and watch them work because I didn't know what was gonna be, but I'm like 15, like I gotta watch these guys because they're gods. And it was, it would be the equivalent of being able to, to watch Picasso <coughs> paint a stroke or to be in a symphony hall to see like Mozart conduct. That's who these guys are. So if you ever get in the presence of greatness, like just go, show up, check it out. Hopefully a little bit of fairy dust will just, you know, get sprinkled on you. Hey, much love, thank you so much. What do you guys think of the new uh, Avatar Life? Actually, what do you think, Jenny? I, you know, I actually think it's it's hard, right? That when you are recreating something after an original that is so beloved, right? And everybody has their own opinion. For me, I think that when I think of it as kind of like a standalone. Um, I wasn't really comparing it too much, but I think they did a really beautiful job. Um, I think that, you know, it's hard. Like, they're trying to tell the story <coughs> with different direction and keep homage to the original. I think Suki did a badass job. Hey! Yes, but, um, <laughs> Suki was pretty good, oh, too. Yeah? Dallas, oh, Dallas yeah. pretty good. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I definitely, but I, I think that um, they did a really great job, and there's a reason why they got picked up for two and three, right? Yeah. yeah. So, it, but it's interesting to just kind of hear the different opinions that the fandom has, you know, because, and we're lucky though, because there's so much love right. for Avatar, right? But it, it feels kind of like a passing of the baton, you know, to the next generation that keeps the Avatar world alive right. and will keep continuing to go yeah it's different it's great i thought it was different but it was very cool to see things come alive um i had early conversations with dallas lou uh before he started shooting as just a young actor he reached out which i love smart. very smart and he's a good kid so we had a lot of great conversations about the character arc and the redemption arc of zuko and just reminding him like don't play the end now just you got a ponytail right now. Don't worry about what's going to happen later. Uh, so it was really cool to see that and have other friends in the show. I mean, me and Jack and Michaela, uh, Saka and Toph from the animated show, we got to go to the premiere. And um, it was great to see all the bending and the, just the world take place, you know, come to, come up, come to lot, come, come alive, really. And then it was really funny because, like, you know, young actors have a lot of respect for you and respect for the for the voice cast, which was really cool. So then all of a sudden, all the young actors started coming up and introducing themselves. And they're like, I'm May, I play May, I play Ty Lee. It's just kind of funny, kind of scene. And I play Suki, you're like, oh damn, well, what's up everybody? But it was just cool to see all, cause the, you know, the cast to me are my friends. And then to see like the like the little versions of themselves so coming up and I'm like, okay, you think you Ty Lee? All right, let's see. <laughs> so I'm, it's exciting, I'm, I'm having a good time. Uh, seeing the new generation. Hey, I have a question for Dante. Hey, what's up, Angie? Right, Angie? Yes. What's poppin'? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the American Dragon Jake Paul. Yeah, what do you want to talk about? Um, so besides Jake, what was your other favorite character? 
And Jay Blonde? Yes. I mean, Food Dog was great because I like John DiMaggio. Working with him is always great. He has a great grandpa too. But I mean, my, I don't know my favorite, but uh, some of my memorable stuff with that show was uh, The Dark Dragon. And just, it's so weird how how things in life and the things you're working on can kind of cross paths. Uh, during that same time when I was shooting it, like, recording that, I had to make, I had like this big dark dragon in my life that I had to confront. Like the oh, same wow. week. Like, I remember like doing the gig and like reading the, the lines and I'm like, wow, I really gotta face my fears like Jake, like this week. And I was, and it was weird like when you're doing it and it's like teaching you a lesson in the moment, I was, uh, it was I was shook at the time. I was like, damn, I can't do this. But I love that. Um, I I haven't really thought about the show that much over the years, but I think I was telling you, I need to, I love that your generation that grew up with Jake Long is now grown enough. Like, I can't wait to do some kind of podcasty, IG Live, something where I can go back, watch some episodes, and have a real conversation with everybody about it, because I think it's an underappreciated show and such a unique, weird show that I want to talk about all the little weird nuances in, in the show. So thank you so much. Let's do one more. Well, actually, I think we're going to say No, 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 I'm saying go first. Oh, we do one and one, one, yeah. Press, see press, is that press it back there? I see press it back there. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey. This is like a two-parter kind of. Okay. It's like a statement slash question. Rock with it. Um, so the statement is just, um, so I have two older sisters, and they're both from Latin American origin. Right. Um, same mom, different dad. Okay. So like, I kind of understand where you were going with everything you were saying earlier. Okay. And um, I definitely just wanted to say that with your quote that you usually sign, you say, um, you know, I may be a warrior, but I'm also a girl, too. I think that that's definitely something that you could use as an analogy for you're not just Latin American, but you're also you. You're also yeah, who you um, are. 100%. And I definitely just want to say that <coughs> your character and the way you said how you had to change your name and do everything, you definitely do represent Suki and definitely represent yourself. And I appreciate oh, thank it. You. Thank you. Bye. And the part two is for both of you, a question kind of. Um, so I know that you also do the podcast with uh, Jenna Barney and uh, Flower Sir as well. Um, and you do all this work with um, Michaela and with Soccer Voice Actor and these other people. What I wanted to know is could we possibly see them, either of them coming to this con or another ranger stop in the future if you could put in a word? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. or why we don't see Aang and if we could possibly get his voice actor to it. Yeah. Him. We see Aang every now and then. I got to yeah. convince him to come out a few things. I got to yeah. find them. You know, the avatar is slippery. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. <laughs> All right, so uh, my question is for Dante. Yes, sir. Um, what was the transition like from doing a character like Jake Long going into Zuko? I don't know. <laughs> no, how I thought about it was like, I don't even know. It, I, I thought like, uh, it was kind of like doing a sitcom and then doing like an hour long show. Like it's like, like from the comedy to like the drama. Even though it's like this comedy in, in Avatar, I was like the drama. So, uh, Jake Long is really me. Like, I'm like fun and hip hop, and like, I improv a lot of those lines, and I'm just kind of like, hey, we're having fun. And then it went from that into like being really serious about what the dialogue was and where this kind of kid was at, because it was more like a world that I was, uh, I was far further from me. And, uh, but I would have a great cast, including the legendary Mako, who would play my uncle and my father several times in my career. Thank you guys. So good.